One of the most exciting areas of uh, new therapy has been the immunotherapies. Uh, we have seen some very exciting results with the CAR T therapy. Um, we have some long-term results that, that have been presented at ASH from the earlier studies, for example, like the LEGEND um, study, LEGEND 2. There were updated results showing that we can have median progression-free survival of uh, well or almost two years plus, suggesting that at least when you use that in the early lines of therapy or less heavily pretreated patients, you could potentially get longer uh, duration of response. And that I think is quite exciting because we have been worried about the fact that some of these responses have been short lasting with the previous trials. Um, it also uh, is very clear that the CAR T therapies um, lead to deep responses with very rapid attainment of MRD negativity. So that is clearly exciting. The other aspect of immunotherapy that's exciting is the T cell engagers or the bites. Um, and we have seen some exciting results with, from the Amgen molecule in the past, suggesting that the majority of the patients get a response and some of them are very deep. And in the ASH uh, this year, there was a presentation from a different molecule um, that again showed that uh, the majority of the patients treated at the highest dose were able to get, achieve a response and majority of them were minimal residual disease negative. So clearly these studies show that the immunotherapy approaches, uh, whether it be uh, a bite or a, uh, or a T cell engager or a CAR T cell, it has a real potential in managing this disease. Clearly, the ongoing studies will tell us where to place them up front or at the first relapse or in selected patients. Those questions need to be answered. And stem cell transplant continues to be an important component of myeloma therapy. So the question that always comes up is the eligibility for a stem cell transplant. Uh, in, historically, the phase three trials have always included patients under 65 for the stem cell transplant. So that age cutoff has often been part of the guidelines. However, based on single institution studies and registry studies, we know that patients uh, up to 75 years of age can safely go through stem cell transplant or even beyond sometimes, and they can also achieve uh, durable responses from the transplant. There was data presented from the registry uh, at, this, at ASH that showed that patients who are over 70 uh, can go through a stem cell transplant and have the outcomes who are quite comparable to what we have seen in the younger patients from the larger trials. We just need to be very careful about um, the presence of comorbidities. So the older patients and sometimes even the younger patients with multiple comorbidities, significant heart disease, significant lung disease, uh, those patients may not be the best candidate to go through a stem cell transplant. Now, renal failure or um, being on hemodialysis is often considered a contraindication for transplant in other diseases. But in myeloma, we have seen over and over again that even patients who are on hemodialysis can potentially go through an autologous stem cell transplant if they meet the criteria in the other areas. So I think the, the eligibility for stem cell transplant is fairly broad. Uh, the, the main reason for not doing it would be you know, a significant cardiac or pulmonary uh, dysfunction. Um, and also, um, you know, very old and much frail uh, patients, especially those beyond age 75. The, the transplant ineligible patients, we have often used regimens uh, that have contained melphalan. Um, in fact, uh, at the um, ASH meeting, there was data from the Alcyon trial that looked at the combination of daratumumab botasimib, melphalan, and prednisone, and demonstrated that in addition to the progression-free survival advantage, there is actually an overall survival advantage for using teratimumab in the combination. So clearly that is a good option for these patients. Um, the Maya trial looked at the combination of teratimumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone that showed that addition of teratimumab clearly improved the progression-free survival, the depth of response. In fact, the MRD negativity rate was significantly higher for the um, uh, combination that contained teratimumab. At the ASH uh, meeting, the trial was updated and the improvement in the progression-free survival continued to show a significant improvement, um, whereas we still don't have any data on the overall survival. So that's clearly a regimen we can use. We know from the previous studies, the combination of botasimib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone can be safely used uh, from the SWOG trial where the addition of botasimib was associated with a significant improvement in progression and overall survival. Subsequently, phase two trials have shown that you can use the same regimen but with a less intense dosing schedule in the older patients and still get comparable benefits. So I think today, uh, for most of the patients, it will be either a combination of botasimib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone with dose modifications, 
a dratimumab lenalidomide and dexamethasone or a dratimumab botosumab melphalan prednisone in areas where the VMP is still considered standard. The only the other group that is really frail and very old, um, certainly we can consider using lenalidomide dexamethasone at, uh, probably starting at a lower dose and then gradually building the way up. So a variety of different uh, regimens are available for treating patients at the time of first relapse. Uh, the several phase three trials have looked at uh, combinations of proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, and monoclonal antibodies uh, in this setting. Um, the treatment choice has to depend on uh, the patient characteristics, the disease characteristics, and also the treatment. So you have to take into account the patient uh, choice, the ability of patients to come to the clinic, um, the, what side effects they have had with the previous therapies, what kind of comorbidities they have, um, and all those have to be factored into the decision-making process. Uh, we need to also factor in what kind of treatments they have had before. Um, so if they have had treatments, uh, depending upon the regimen they have had before, we want to try and change the, the class of agents and we want to probably try and introduce a new uh, class of drug when they have the disease relapse. So disease-related characteristics, treatment-related characteristics, and the patient-related characteristics all need to be taken into account when you select the therapy. Uh, myeloma is a very heterogeneous disease with very different outcomes depending upon a variety of different uh, risk characteristics. One of the primary drivers of disease outcome in myeloma is the presence of genetic abnormalities. So that has always been an integral part of most of the risk stratification systems we use. So currently we use the revised ISS staging system that incorporates some of the high-risk cytogenetics into it. Um, so we know that patients with uh, high-risk uh, cytogenetics need to be approached differently. So the approach in patients with high-risk disease has been to use multiple multi-drug combinations, the most effective regimens we have, and in transplant-eligible patients using one or two transplants, and often maintaining them with uh, combinations of therapies instead of using single drug maintenance. Uh, the goal in the patients with high-risk disease is to try and see if we can get them to be minimal residual disease negative. So more of a response-adaptive therapy by in introducing multi-drug combinations and changing treatments might be the best way to deal with the high-risk patients. Obviously, there are other characteristics that uh, contribute to high-risk features. One of it is the presence of renal failure. So obviously, we need to make dose modifications for the drugs for patients who are um, uh, in renal failure uh, when, they, when they're diagnosed. Uh, we obviously also uh, need to take into account um, the frailty and the age of the patients, and that also contributes to the risk of um, uh, the, 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 how the disease or the, how the disease behaves in those patients. So we have to make appropriate dose adjustments for the older patients. Now, the time of the relapse, too, it's quite important, um, the risk stratification. The genetic risks are still important. For example, the presence of deletion 17P and the 1Q amplification, both can influence um, how the patient's uh, disease behaves. So that has to be taken into account. But one of the most important prognostic factors at the time of relapse is the, how long the first uh, treatment lasted. So if the first treatment lasted for less than 12 months, and if in the case of transplant with maintenance, if it lasted for less than a couple of years, then we know we are dealing with a highly aggressive disease, and they have to be treated again with multi-drug combinations for longer periods of time. Finally, there are a variety of other factors that have been described, like presence of circulating plasma cells, uh, high LDH that's part of ISS staging system, uh, presence of high proliferation rate, um, all have been you know, reported to have an influence on the outcomes of so we also need to treat those patients with a high-risk type of approach.